So I'm just going to run through some random questions in no particular order that I received in the survey I sent out or through office hours. Um, if you have questions about the difference between a one sample T and independent T and a dependent T, I please refer you to the other video because I separated that content out. Um, so one question was, why do we have to use the T and not the Z? And I'm going to try and make this a short summary because we kind of covered it already, but um, I'd like to make sure that it's clear. So if I have the, pretend that's normally distributed, if I have the Z distribution looking like that, and we're supposed to be using the T distribution, which is going to look more like this, um, what Gossett realized is that um, the T distribution is a more accurate reflection of how the distribution really looks. So you, let's say this was a one-tailed test. Do you see how this would be 5% in the upper tail of the Z distribution? If that red zone is 5%, do you see how if I should have been using the green distribution, and I'll put that one in purple, do you see how this is far more than 5%? Because this little red zone is 5%. So if I use this line to define my rejection region for the green line, this is far more than 5%. Maybe I'll put it in yellow. You can see here, this would be the, the shading of the distribution in the green distribution if I used this marker as my cutoff for my rejection region, and it's far more than 5%. So if that's the case, then the, um, the rejection region is larger than 5%, which is not good. And then um, if I wanted to find what my true critical T value should be, it's going to be out here in the tail somewhere where this area now is 5%. So my critical T values are going to be much larger than my Z critical values. And so essentially the bottom line is we can only use the Z come on, when we know the standard deviation of the population. That's very rare to know the standard deviation of the population. So we use the T when we don't know sigma, which is most often the case. This is why a t-test is far more common than a z-test. So if we don't know sigma, then we're going to use the standard deviation of the sample instead. Okay, so that was that question. Um, another question I got is when we're looking at the um, t-table to define our rejection region with the critical values, are we always going to use the 0.05 column? So yes, alpha here is always going to be 0.05, so you're going to use that first column in the t-table whenever I'm asking you to find the rejection region. Now, being that I said that, I would like to transition this question or this to answer a question about what are p-values. And I do want to recommend that you go back, if you haven't yet watched the video about p-values, please do so. It will be on the test. But let's talk about p-values. So let's say I have a distribution and let's say that I calculate my t calculated. This is what I did in the math. Maybe um, I did it by hand or maybe JASP did it for me. And my t calculated is here. And now I'm trying to see if it's in the rejection region. But notice I didn't put my rejection region in here. Now if I had put my rejection region in here, maybe actually just to keep it clear, let's make it a one-tailed um, test because I think it makes it easier to understand. So let's make it an upper tailed test. Now if I had had my rejection region in here and that was 5%, do you see how it's obvious when I draw my rejection region that my calculated T is in the rejection region, right? Well, let's say I don't have my rejection region. I take it away. Now I have to see if it's in the rejection region. Well, what um, JASP is telling you is it looked up from this value till the end of the distribution. And so let's say that it says, hey, this probability is 0.03. Otherwise, you could consider that as 3%. If that's 3%, do you see how that tells us automatically it's in the rejection region? Because the rejection region was 5%. And so if this area is 5%, then clearly anything in this area has to be under 5%. So this T calculated by knowing that it's, there's 3% um, from this score to the end of the distribution, I know that it is in the rejection region because the rejection region is 
So I didn't really need to have my rejection region as long as I know this value is under 5%. So p-values, which are reported in JASP, anything under 0 0.05, or that's 5%, we are going to reject the null because we know it's in the rejection region if it's under 5%. Now someone asked a question, does this still hold true if it's two-tailed? So notice in JASP, you have to indicate whether something's one-tailed or two-tailed. And so it does the adjustments for you. So you still just read it as uh, any value less than 0.05, you reject the null. It has already accounted for the fact that if it's one-tailed or two-tailed. So this is a really good thing to remember moving forward because um, 0.05 will work for every test we ever do. Okay, moving on. Um, some people asked um, how we will do the JASP portion of the exam and that will be the take home portion. So um, the way that's gonna look is the last, the last question on the exam will give you the data set and you will download that before you submit the exam and then um, you will work on that and upload it into a different prompt, which have been detailed in the announcements page. This exam is considered open note. So some people have been asking, can we still get cheat sheets? So it is open note, open book. Um, however, it is not open internet or open person. So no other people. <laughs> um, and you won't be able to surf the web. So make sure you have your notes organized. I do recommend you have a cheat sheet because I don't want you wasting time flipping through pages, but it is open note. Um, let's see, I'm just scrolling through my notes. Variables. When you're looking at entering data into JASP, whether you're doing a dependent T or an independent T, you always wanna make sure you're aware of the order that the data are going in. Now the dependent T, it's how you put the data in um, the analysis for the independent T, you have to change the variables. And if you're not sure how to do this, again, I refer you back to several of the example videos on how to do this. But essentially, let's say that I have, um, I'll just leave them. Let's say I have um, coffee drinkers versus uh, water drinkers. And I think, I wonder if people who drink coffee are going to do better on the test than those who drink water. Which is the variable that most interests me? Which is the one I'm wondering, like, hey, I wonder if this is going to make you do better. Hopefully you picked up on the fact that it's the coffee. This is more of my placebo kind of thing, right? So since coffee is the variable that interests me, if I have 10 coffee drinkers versus 10 water drinkers, then when I'm doing my math, I want to do the average coffee performance minus the average water performance. And that way, if coffee drinkers perform better on the test than water drinkers, then the number will be positive. And then I know that coffee drinkers did better. Let's say that coffee drinkers did worse, then coffee minus water will be a negative score. And now I know drinking coffee made you do worse on the test. And so this is why order matters, is that you wanna be able to interpret your final outcome um, to know whether coffee was good for you or whether it was the water that was good for you. So for how to do that in JAS, go back to those videos. There's a several videos for each kind to uh, use as examples for that. Um, somebody asked, what would you do if, what would happen if you tried to do an independent T when it warranted a dependent T and vice versa? Um, and so I'm going to make a new page here. Let's see if it'll just, oh, sure, save it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's say that you're looking at your data, and I've, I'm, I've made several videos about this already, but I, you know it's worth asking and reiterating. If you have a dependent T data set, then you're going to get something like let's let's not do before and after because I've done that one so many times. But let's say I'm looking at m mothers and um, daughters, and if they're the same height, what you're going to see is your outcome, your data are going to look like this. Here's the mother's height, here's the daughter's height. Now this is for the Joneses, and this is for the Dams, and this is for the other people. So um, you'll see that these are basically, the data are all numbers. Versus if you're looking at an independent T, you're going to have condition and then number. So it would be something like um, coffee, this person drank coffee, this person drank coffee, this person drank water, this person drank water. And then you have how they did on the test. 
So you see how the data are going to look different? In the independent T, you have to have nominal data and numerical data. The dependent T requires all numerical data. So some of you sent me emails saying, hey, on the homework, it kept giving me an error. Well, that's because you were doing the wrong test. So if you have your data set up right, JASP won't let you do the wrong test. So this is a really easy way of knowing um, which test is warranted is just looking at your data. All right, I think um, that's all the questions that I got. Um, all right, so email me if you have more questions. Otherwise, I will just continue to make this exam and send out positive vibes your way.